There is only So uh, today's, uh, today's message, Living Your Best Life Now, uh, this is rooted in this thing that we've had for May uh, around uh, not only the, sacred, the idea of the sacred feminine, but also the idea of uh, uh, newness, of uh, the growth incorporating ideas of spring, and also how uh, the gestation time of winter is now over and it's now time to give birth to uh, something new. And uh, that we've been discussing how this idea of the sacred uh, feminine is a culmination of uh, there's been different tacks on it with Mother's Day thrown in the middle of there. And how the concepts of, of sacred feminine have uh, evolved over time. So through, the, uh, through indigenous uh, religions of, um, of more quote-unquote primitive cultures of 20,000 plus years ago, uh, evolving into the so-called pagan religions, and then even influencing uh, the uh, modern uh, Christianity with its veneration of Mary, the mother of Jesus, who was elevated in stature as Jesus became the Son of God. So, and this makes sense if you stop to think about it. So whether or not the person of Jesus is uh, transformed or elevated or promoted to the Godhead, uh, that the mother should be elevated along with him. And so there's a whole story and a whole narrative that has evolved uh, through that beyond what we learn in what we uh, call the scriptures. So, uh, and, and in this way, it's also a way to incorporate the sacred feminine of existing systems at the time into the new religion of this cult of Jews who started calling themselves Christians. So whether we're speaking about in, in the Hebrew Bible of uh, Sarah or Rebecca or Dinah or Elizabeth or the Marys in the New Testament because there was a few of them, uh, there has been a recognition of the role of the feminine uh, in spirituality and in religion, though often in organized religion in a more supportive way in modern times, kind of a behind the scenes role. So post-crucifixion we have uh, women also who've been elevated then as saints as a way of incorporating the local sacred feminine ideas into the new religion. So. Uh, Monica, the mother of Augustine, uh, Helen, the saint who is supposed to have uh, kept the cross that Jesus was crucified on, uh, Sophia connected to the Byzantine era, Sophia being Greek for wisdom, right, Sophia, uh, and uh, or Bridget of the Celts, particularly in Ireland, St. Bridget is still venerated, and she was actually a quote-unquote pagan goddess that was incorporated into uh, 5th, 6th century Catholicism in that area. So those are just a few. There are countless others. You know, even if you look into more modern times, uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe in, uh, in Mexico, Our Lady of Lourdes, where Reverend Dr. Jim Lockhart and his wife Dorianne are there. If you go on Facebook, if you're following them, they're in Lourdes right now, uh, having uh, an experience over there. Uh, even in Ireland, uh, uh, at Knock, the Virgin Mary is to have appeared. And in fact, there's a, uh, there was a fella coming around a few years ago, I think in Sarajevo or somewhere over in, uh, in the Balkans somewhere and also uh, you know, Mary sightings. <laughs> I don't know any other way to put it. But, but, and people, people are really moved by this experience. 
Uh, and I, I have to say that for myself, I'm somewhat skeptical. But I love the idea that people are looking to uh, the sacred feminine in a religion that is so steeped in the masculine. And so what we know about that is that, <clears throat> that God is, uh, that there's no gender to God. There's no gender to spirit. That it is an amalgam. It's an amalgam of both masculine and feminine. And yet at the same time, how can we, those of us, uh, you know, the four of us, four men in the audience, five and with Mike in the back, so y'all are probably used to accessing that sacred feminine, I don't know. But <clears throat> for men, maybe that's, uh, maybe that's an obstacle. And yet I think it's so important that we be able to do that. So again, remembering as we've explored these ideas through this past month, that there is within us, there is within us that integrated whole that is an amalgam of the feminine and masculine principle. The assertive masculine principle, the receptive feminine principle, uh, combining, if you will, for one thing, what Holmes calls the androgynous one. The one mind, the one power, the one spirit. So that when we use the expression, there is a power available to everyone and we can use it. This is what we are talking about. <coughs> that amalgam of sacred and fem feminine, the androgynous one. It is the recognition that there is that within us, which is the individualized expression of spirit. That it is the individualized expression of the unified whole. That it is within us. That this power is within every aspect of our being. To the smallest little particle that makes up this physical body. To every, ax, uh, every a, um, aspect of our consciousness. That it's holographic in nature. So that you can't break up any part of it where there's not some God aspect in there. That it is that within us that has, been viol has never been violated in any way. And it is not limited in any way. It is the infinite creative power of the one mind of spirit expressing as life within us and throughout all of creation. Your life, my life, it is power. It is all power. And we can use it. <clears throat> but how? But how? Because we know that it's limited only by what? Our understanding of it. Right? Our understanding of it. Our thinking around it. Our consciousness. Our consciousness is the gatekeeper or the portal, depending on how we choose to use it. So, and as we know, there are many names for this one power. We talked about some of them this morning in our opening ritual. Joel Goldsmith would call it presence. <coughs> Ernest Holmes called it spirit. Eckhart Tolle calls it presence. And the way that we access presence then is in what he calls the now. And it's now as a pronoun, right? Because he capitalizes now whenever he uses it in the book. <clears throat> and so he, and he uses it in a way that you could almost but not quite use it interchangeably with spirit or with power. Because it's, it's, it's both presence and power, right? So what we're doing is cultivating presence by cultivating the now and in cultivating the now, we're cultivating the, the now. So, and I've re recently rediscovered this book and wanted to share bits of it with you this morning. So, how can we access the now? Man, I've got an itchy nose this morning. So, <clears throat> uh, how, how can we access the now? Well, the technique, like a lot of things, the technique is relatively simple. It's relatively simple. And by like going to the gym or playing a musical instrument, 
or doing anything that's worth doing, it takes some practice to become proficient at it. So it's a simple, it's as simple as the ABCs. Remember uh, Dr. Dennis Merritt Jones, his ABCs, awareness builds consciousness. Remember, you've heard that one, yeah? Aware Isn't that a good one? Awareness builds consciousness. And so this is what we're doing when we're using this technique of accessing the power of now. So <clears throat> he brings and has a really a quite lengthy discussion on the attachment of ego to mind, small mind, our thinking mind. And that the mind uh, is strongly attached to time. So one of the first things that we really need to let go of is our attachment to time. Because we're either, when we are attached to time, we're either anchored or stuck in the past, in past thought threads of not enoughness or, or whatever it is. You know, that they done me wrong song, right? <coughs> Or, we are looking to the future for what? For our salvation. That's a strong word. We're looking to the future for our salvation. To be saved from what? From our present predicament. And so what often happens is through working both sides of the equation, rather than being in the present moment, all we are really doing is allowing ourselves to be distracted from what? The right now. Now this is, these are not new concepts. Right? They very, sound very Eastern, yes? And so what he talks about is that one of the ways that we can kind of break this down is to look at time in two different ways. One as clock time and the other as psychological time. So when we are stuck in the past, revisiting uh, old ways of thinking, that we are in psychological time. And you know, this could also be pleasant thoughts, right? So remember the idea in uh, uh, the, the Buddhist idea that our attachments can also be pleasant. So we can be revisiting some past pleasant memory also. That can pull us. That can pull us from the now. Psychological time. And then there's clock time. Clock time is a tool that we can use in this moment. So you know, we have to, we have to uh, be aware of, uh, of clock time in that you know, we, we have goals in our life that we want to uh, accomplish. We have uh, uh, the, our daily activities that we want to accomplish. And at the same time, we, what we're not wanting to do is to get caught up in shifting the clock time where we are observing what's going on into psychological time where we're attached to process. That we're attached to the story. We're attached even really to outcome. So that uh, Tole, which by the way, it, I did some, it is Tole. I looked it up on the internet, four different sources, because I, I don't know about you, but I've been confused about that. And his first name, he changed to Eckhart. Did you know this? I didn't know this either. It was like Ulrich or something. How we say it in German? Ulrich. So at any rate, so, uh, that's neither here nor there, except just a little FYI. So in the normal mind identify, or what he's calling an unenlightened state of consciousness, the power and infinite creative potential that lie concealed in the now are completely obscured by psychological time. And what that looks like is that our life then loses its vibrancy, its freshness, its sense of wonder. That old patterns of thought, emotion, behavior, reaction, and desire are acted out in repeat performances. A script, a script in our mind that gives us an identity of sorts. 
but distorts and covers up the reality of the now. Pretty simple idea, but profound in its implications. Because if you think about the way that our thought patterns often operate, it, they are anchored in story. That's the past. So, if we find that our life, even in short bits, and I'm, in short bits I'm saying for days at a time, right? so, uh, you know, when our life loses its vibrancy, its freshness, its sense of wonder, you know, that kind of sounds like having a case of the blues to me, right? Uh, the old patterns, so then what does that do? That triggers uh, patterns of old thought, emotion, behavior, reaction, and desire, or, or desire. And then we act it out in a repeat performance. So, one of the things that often happens when we come to uh, religious science is that we're looking for and identifying old patterns of thinking that no longer serve us. And in that awareness then, we, can, we see the repeated pattern. Yes? Or is that just me? Oh, thank God. <laughs> so this is a cycle that we're wanting to break. Well, how do we do that? Well, the way that we do that is by developing our powers of observation of the mind using this idea of clock, what he calls clock time. Because if we don't, what, what uh, Tolle says is that consequently then, this is what happens. If we allow ourselves to stay stuck in this other state of consciousness, then inevitably what happens is we then create an obsession of the future as an escape from the unsatisfactory present. Right? So they're tied, psychologically, they are tied together. Right? So, uh, crummy past, story, struggle, uh, not enough, uh, heartache, uh, you know, whatever. Then, you know, if I just had, if I just had uh, him, it'd be perfect. If I just had a million dollars, if I just won Powerball, right? <laughs> if I just finished my book, if I just lost 20 pounds, right? That's all futurized. We all do it, yeah? Okay, but, and those can be goals. And on some level, the goal, I think, does kind of take on an obsession kind of energy to it. But but it's not it's not really <laughs> obsession as it is determined focus. Determined focus is the observer. Obsession obsession is the ego. Right? Obsession is this idea of psychological time. So we must develop an awareness of living in time and develop powers of observation and discernment. That's the, the bottom line uh, in the, these few pages. Now I have to tell you, this stuff's kind of dense. I've been reading like these four pages every day for a week, <laughs> trying to get it broke down. And, and the way that he does it is very eloquent and simple, but yet it's kind of like reading a textbook. You know, It's like, yeah, it makes sense, but now tell somebody else what it means. So, <clears throat> so I'm just going to uh, give you a little more, uh, uh, another blast of Tolle here. So the enlightened, un the enlightened person's main focus uh, of attention then is always in the now, but they are still peripherally aware of time. So in other words, we're not out in la-la land, right? We're, we're in the world, but not of the world as the master teacher would say. That we have developed our powers through what? Through meditation. And by the way, he says 10 or 15 minutes is all it takes a day. Right? It doesn't have to be the 30 minute of some price in his experience. And I can tell you for a fact that some meditation is better than none. That a regular committed practice is better than a spotty practice. But a spotty practice is better than no practice. 
Right? So again, it's not going to help. We don't want to build this idea of psychological time by judging our meditation. That's not helpful either. <laughs> oh, I should be more spiritual because I'm not meditating enough. Bollocks! <laughs> so, <laughs> so, in other words, <laughs> they are still peripherally aware of time. So in other words, they continue to use the tool of clock time, observing, and, and remaining free of psychological time. So he says this, so be alert as you practice this so that you do not unwittingly transform clock time into psychological time. So for instance, if you've made a mistake in the past, learn from it in the now. If you're doing that, clock time. Okay, on the other hand, if you dwell on it mentally with self-criticism, remorse, if the, if guilt comes up, if you uh, make the mistake of going into me and mine, okay, this is linked into a false sense of identity. That's the cue that, oh, I'm in psychological time. And you step back as you observe. Now, how can we do that? Just a few simple breaths, a few simple conscious breaths can pull us back enough <coughs> to see and to observe. And so from the place of observation then, we develop an ability to see our life clearly and develop and to develop the uh, ability to live in real time. This is the now, living in real time, living in reality. So then we are no longer shackled by the past and we're no longer looking to the future for our salvation to be saved but rather that we are living in the now comfortable in our own skin living in effective ways and then also from this place understanding that in the clarity of our thinking then the use of the law is now our default mechanism now it's much more effective to use it consciously, for sure. But as we develop in our practice, we will find that things demonstrate in our life really before we even ask for them. Have you not found this is true? When you've really, uh, when your practice has been strong and things are going okay and it just seems like things just kind of present themselves. Right? So that's what's going on. So let's uh, let's take a deep breath. As Sharon gives us a little music. So this is from our friend Ernest Holmes. So when we're living in this uh, the the uh, consciousness of the observer, we are then able to affirm that we belong, that we belong in this universe in which we live. That a power greater than you are, greater than I am, that a power greater than we are has put us here. That everyone, everyone has a place to fill in life. And the world has need for you and for me right now. Therefore, we affirm and we believe this to be so. That we are one with life because we represent life. We are one with infinite intelligence because we can think and we can reason and we have the capacity to choose. That we are a creation in divine mind expressing as divine mind. So in this way that we truly are Child of God. There is only.